Hi everyone, welcome to the latest edition of our author interview series, a book trib and Merrill Moss Media production. We are thrilled to be chatting with debut author Diane B. Saxton, whose novel Peregrine Island released on August 2nd. Dan was a journalist for the Greenwich Review and Vanity Fair UK before becoming a novelist, and we're thrilled that she's here to discuss her first book with us. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Diane. Before we begin, do you mind giving our audience a quick introduction to Peregrine Island just for any of our viewers who haven't gotten the chance to read it yet? Sure. Um, it takes place over one summer um, here, and I've got, you know, I had three or four different descriptions. It's really, but it's the, really the mystery behind an heirloom painting um, in which the family gets very involved, when, especially when strangers appear at their door. Um, inordinate, no, I can't say that word, inordinately um, interested in this painting. Um, this was a favorite painting of one of the characters, and it just becomes, it's the mystery behind that painting. Um, that's the, the plot, at least. Okay, and um, also important to note that it takes place on a private island with one family, that's essentially. Uh, and actually, my first question I wanted to ask you is, um, why did you choose to set the story on a private island? Um, that actually just came, but the more I thought about it, these characters are, I don't want to say they're disturbed, because I think that most people are disturbed in a way. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> is yeah. disturbed in a way. But I wanted to emphasize that, and um, their sense of isolation. Mm -hmm. And they're on an island, and their character comes out, I think, more because of that. They, they don't have any interfering forces, in mm -hmm. other words, or um, society around them. So you really see their characters. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think it also helps um, really emphasize how invaded they feel when those art exactly. experts sort of flock to the island to invade their space, literally that's and true. figuratively. That's but yeah, true. that's pretty interesting. Um, my next question I wanted to ask you was if there's any real life inspiration for the story itself, um, not just for the story of the painting, but possibly for the characters like Winter or Elsie or Peta. Not really. Um, not really. I just, it's interesting. They just kind of organically grew. Mm -hmm. Where they came from, I don't know. Uh, I think that's a very interesting part of writing mm -hmm. that people just appear, animals appear. <laughs> See, I'm, you know, it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Not at all. I mean, people imagine crazy, crazy things. So um, <laughs> imagining three characters on an island obsessed with a painting is not so out of line, though I think the story does get pretty pretty crazy down the line, though I don't want to spoil anything because it is a mystery. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask you, like sort of going back to the island idea, um, the island is in Long Island Sound. It's Paragon Island, obviously. Um, but the way you write it, it seems almost as if there's a lot of authenticity to your imagining of this island and your imagining of the sound. I just wanted to ask, have you spent a lot of time on the sound? Is that a part of you know your history as a person like having spent a lot of time there or is it just um, based on maybe some other shorelines that you've spent some time on? No, I lived on the Sound um, for a long time um, in Stamford on Ship and Point mm -hmm. actually on a point off the point and we were surrounded by water so um, that's the inspiration. That is the inspiration as well as the art as well. Mm -hmm. How was it to revisit that? Because I feel as though a lot of the descriptors of the island and the environment in the book not only are really intertwined with some of the character experiences and like what's going on with them mentally, but also it just um, it's almost as if the island itself is another character in the novel. So I'm, I, w I was wondering if you could expand on why you felt that the environment was so essential to these characters. Oh, I think it is. It's interesting. When I left... Um my home there, I had very mixed feelings about it. I loved it. Um, and that's really, that's why, one of the reasons I wanted to write this. Um, I just felt that the the sound, the ocean, um, I put that on the, in the acknowledgments, um, a river, um, a bay, uh, anything, a body of water adds so much to life. I mean, you look at a bird or a fish, or anything. It's just part of life and I wanted to emphasize their feelings with nature, 
which that's what it really comes down to, I think. Mm -hmm. Which I think people are much more influenced, actually, by their surroundings than you think. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and in the novel you do a great job of that, um, of comparing those two elements. So I really, good. really enjoyed that aspect of the novel. Oh, good. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and kind of going off of that a little bit, um, for anybody who hasn't read the book yet, the novel is structured so that there are three points of view that tell the story. It's Winter, the grandmother, Elsie, her daughter, and then her daughter, Peta, who's a child. And I wanted to ask you why you chose to structure the novel that way with those three points of view, and um, why you chose those three, like, those three specific characters to um, sort of tell the story through. Um, that's a good question. I'm writing another book now in the third person, and I don't like it as much because I can't, I can't get into their soul as, as much. Mm -hmm. I can't say things that they think. I don't know how to say things that they really, really think, um, which is okay because it's historical. But I wanted to get into their psyches um, and give the reader their thoughts, and I, I thought that was a very good way of doing it. Um, and I, um, I think as we were talking about before, um, I'm very interested in the different ages, um, of life mm -hmm. and, um, what people, uh, I, the more I live, the more I see it, how desire and people want things, um, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 60s, they're beginning to trickle down, I think. And then uh, children don't. They don't want the power. Well, not, you know, not like, like an adult. And they don't want things, stuff. Um, <laughs> and so I really wanted to, to I mean, Elsie wanted love a lot. Mm -hmm. She did it. She, her sex, she wanted sex. And she thought that through that she would um, have love. Um, the mother wanted, was... I think her, her background was very important to her, or who she was mm -hmm. was very important to her, and that's how she projected it. And the child didn't want anything. That's what I was trying to get at. She just was, I think, well, anyway, that's what I think. Does that answer your question? I, th I think it does. I think um, essentially what you're getting at is the fact that you chose those three specific characters not only because the book is largely about you know, family relationships, which I'm hoping we can talk about a bit more later, <coughs> but also because I think that those three different ages have completely distinct perspectives on the action of the story. And I think that kind of reflects exactly what you're saying about wanting things and the different things that we do want at different points in our lives. So I think that's really interesting and a very um, insightful way of telling a story. Uh, a bit less deep than that, maybe a bit more of a shallow question, but out of the three characters that you tell the story, through which one was your favorite to write like which one of those psyches was your favorite to inhabit or did you not have a favorite oh yeah no I definitely did, <laughs> did I, do this? I didn't know I don't know if I did um definitely the child Peta. Mm -hmm. I loved writing her interesting <laughs> why is it is it because of that sort of innocence and lack of wants do you think or um, yeah it's the way she looked at the world I thought yeah I mean there was no pretense mm -hmm. at all which, I, I mean, everybody, if you think about it, politicians, everybody, they always have a, an agenda, some reason, why they, you know, you know why they tick. Mm -hmm. uh, and she doesn't have anything. She, but except she lo wants everybody to love her and she wants to love everybody. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, even crabs. <laughs> <laughs> True, yeah. Which, I, I don't know, what's cool about that is that everybody does want love in their own way if you think about it in the novel it's just different expressions of love which is something that's that true. now that you're talking more about it I'm thinking back and it makes a lot of sense yeah it's interesting it's like I'm <laughs> learning new things about the book when I'm interviewing you who would have thought <laughs> just kidding but okay um I'm kind of jumping off of that another question I was really interested in specifically was um that this book is very much to do with the relationships between mothers and daughters. And the book itself is dedicated to your mother, and you write that she believed in the importance of family, which I think is an interesting dedication. And I just wanted to ask you to expand on the role of mothership and you know, motherhood, rather, and being a daughter 
and how that really is something that's explored within the novel. God, I think it's such a complicated kind of relationship. Anybody who is a mother or a daughter can probably agree with that. And it's very mixed feelings. Um, I think that's true in any family, and I think it's with fathers and sons and fathers and daughters and siblings as well. Um, I thought that by using a mother and daughter, it would be more prominent. Um, they all love each other a lot, but they don't know how to show it, and they don't know how to react to each other. And I think I tried to show that. I don't know if I did. I hope I did that. Um, I think so. <laughs> Okay, and that they come from, another thing I tried to do, the different generations as you go from era to era, mm -hmm. I think that people react to that and change accordingly, and sometimes those generations don't know how to interact, and I did try and show that as well, so, and plus the fact, they're very different personalities, mm -hmm. very. Very much so. So, and again, I tried to show that. Mm -hmm. um, this, Kind of jumping off that generational point of view, um, when, I, when I was reading the book, I had the sense that much of the communication that goes on between these three women, um, it's loaded with the secrets that they keep, have kept from each other and that they um, maybe even keep from themselves as well. And um, I, I wanted to ask you about that as well. So what is the function of the family secret in this novel? And why did that appeal to you as something that you wanted to explore, especially in like a mystery novel setting? I don't know how to answer that without giving the story away, really. <laughs> um, well, if you want, we can just full stop on that question, if that if that's okay. No, let me think about that. How it's the, I don't know how to answer it. It's the secrets, obviously, behind the painting, um, and behind but uh, um, behind themselves, actually, as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that it is an heirloom, and that people don't, a lot of people, not everybody, um, don't really know what happened or care to know why people become who they become. And that is revealed at the end with the painting. Mm -hmm. So, Well, actually, now that I'm thinking about this, we haven't really discussed the art element of this novel as much as maybe we should have to begin with. Um, let me ask you, what came first, the desire to write a novel about family and generations and secrets, or the desire to write a novel that has an element of art mystery to it? Oh, that's a good question, too. I just remember going, I kept looking at this one painting and wondering why the painter painted it. Um, I still do. And if you look at the painting that, um, this is by a painting by Luigi uh, Loire, who I think is a, a wonderful painter. Um, and he painted this, a painting that I adore of a man on a wharf. And I tried to um, write about that painting as much as I could. Um, and that was really the jumping off point of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's a dog in it and two men. But anyway, if you see it, you, um, you'll you see why. I'm sure, you know, most people, don't they, or don't you? Haven't you ever seen a painting that you love and you're curious about? Oh, yeah, all the time. I, I've been lucky to grow up with a lot of art <coughs> around me. So, um, yeah, it's something that I think that a lot of people can relate to and something that I think is one of the most relatable elements to Winter's character. Maybe um, not to the degree that she's so invested in this painting emotionally but the idea of just being able to get lost in somebody else's picture and to a certain extent somebody else's life I think is very relatable so I found that really interesting. Well she was trying to escape reality really. So. Exactly but aren't we all to a certain extent? Yeah exactly. <laughs> it's true. It's yeah. true. You know that reminds me of another artist who paints usually only and he's very well known. Did I, I don't know if I talked about this with you um, he paints children in kitchens, and there's always another kind of animal there. It's very <laughs> strange, and I need to go and really look him up and really, because he's well known. Why he always does that? It's always the kitchen boy. <laughs> That's very strange, but it sounds interesting. It's definitely worth Googling. So everybody <laughs> Google that. Kitchen child painter. 
sounds pretty interesting. But yeah, I mean, speaking of sort of your knowledge of art, it seems as though you have a pretty um, healthy knowledge of it. Uh, how familiar are you with the art world, which is clearly a huge part of this novel? I love art. Um, not all kinds of art. Um, I, I'm just a novice at it, but I really, I like it and I've, I've um, it's one of my hobbies. Um, I've never really studied it. I can draw Snoopy. <laughs> That's about it. That counts. That counts. No shame. Not that knowledgeable, really. Yeah. Anyway. You could have fooled me because the characters who are art experts in the novel are, um, even though they're maybe not as rich as the three narrators, they're certainly um, quite interesting. And I, and I really found them to be, some, occasionally they can be delightfully despicable, which I, which I enjoyed. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was pretty interesting. And kind of speaking of that and jumping off that point, uh, the names of characters in this novel, the names are very, very interesting. And I wanted to ask you um, maybe specifically about the three narrators, but also some of the minor characters like, like Hamlet, for instance, why you chose to name them the way you did. Or did it just sort of evolve that way based on the mental image that you formed of them as characters? Um, they all have, each name has a reason for being. Um, Hamlet is named uh, obviously after Hamlet, mm -hmm. Shakespeare. I named quite a number of people after Shakespearean characters. Mm -hmm. uh, a just Hamlet a, and a Horatio. I'm sorry? And a Horatio. Oh, that's true. To, I, I wanted to add another element to their character because the characters they're named after have the same kind of personalities. Um, who else? Shall I go on about Winter and uh, the main characters? You can. No? I think Winter, um, being the oldest character in the book, who also can be a, quite a cold mother herself, Winter makes a lot of sense. But right. I was wondering about Elsie specifically, because um, her real name is Elsa Path. And I am unfamiliar with you know, the origins of that name, and I would love for you to expand on it, if you could. Well, the spelling is E-L-S-P-A-T-H, and I spelled it in the book, E-L-S-E-P-A-T-H. Winter named her that because she loved England, and she loved anything that she thought was proper, only she misspelled it. And that is, <laughs> I did that deliberately. Um, and that's her character which is kind of sad in a way, it's kind of, um, don't you think? I think it's... Um, yeah, certainly I am. I think that that's a really interesting way of looking at her characters because her mother wants her to be one thing, but Elsie is clearly another. That's true, too, yeah. yeah. And Elsie is the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. And she would never use the name she decided that she would be Elsie, even though she was teased in school. Um, Elsie the cow, that kind of thing. But. <laughs> It's horrible. <laughs> Anybody, anything, the cow is just <laughs> full stop. No more of that. But yeah, it's really interesting um, to think about, especially spelling wise, because it's a very subtle thing, but it makes a lot of sense. So yeah, um, I actually want to move on to a couple of questions about your writing process, if you don't mind. Um, first of all, I mean, very generally, I mean, what's your writing process like? I mean, where do you like to write? Do you listen to music when you write? Or. Do you need to force yourself to write? Are you one of those writers who like needs to say, okay, I need an hour a day to write? Or does it just come naturally and you can just do it? Um, I write at night when you can't, there's nothing around, there's no noise, no interference. Um, and I will write all night. And I do it when I can, which, um, and I don't do an hour a day. I don't know how writers can do that. Mm -hmm. If they really get into it, how do you do that? Because I'll write for seven, eight hours, and I don't even know it's seven or eight hours. So how does anybody do one hour? I mean, maybe with nonfiction, but fiction? Not even with nonfiction. Um, I just, I write with huge chunks of time. And then I might not write for two days. And then go back and then do, because I think you get into another, or at least I do, another mode of living, thinking. I don't even want to say thinking. It's a type of meditation almost. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it comes pretty naturally to you though. I mean, you have what it seems like your very own rhythm, so to speak. Yeah, it's kind of sporadic. <laughs> sporadic, 
<laughs> sporadic counts as a rhythm, as long as <laughs> there's some regularity to it, which I imagine there has to be if you're writing a novel. <laughs> so I don't know. But kind of jumping off of that, uh, when you're writing a mystery and you get into it for seven or eight hours at a chunk, um, is it because you know where it's going and you're sort of going full steam ahead towards that ending revelation that you're aware of? Or are you writing because you're searching for the answer to the mystery because you don't know it yet? Yes, exactly. No, that's the fun of writing, I think. Mm -hmm. um, at least for me. I don't like, I don't outline. Um, I like to find out what's going to happen. Even when I'm editing, I'll redo something and say, oh, that looks, that's a much better way. I'll see you had much more fun doing that or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think it's fun to do that. Um, it's, it's better than reading a book because you're doing it yourself. Although books are easier to, if you're reading, it's much easier. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think some books can be hard to read, but I'm, I don't, I've never written a novel, so I wouldn't know. Really? But what's hard to read? Which one is hard to read? It's interesting. There are a couple, I think, in, I think. That, that exist in the world. Um, but yeah, for, I don't know. Pardon? For you. I'm just interested in what would be hard to read. Well, we can talk later about that if you like. But okay. okay. Right now it's all about you. Okay. So um, one thing that I was really wondering when I was reading Peregrine Island and afterwards was what books were you reading when you were writing the novel? Or do you not read when you're writing? Oh God, yeah. I do. I read constantly. I have no idea what I was reading then. <laughs> I read so much that, um, um, I, I, and I, I like going back. I just saw a book that I love, <laughs> and I love the writer. I love the. I don't know. Have you ever heard of it? Um, Time and Again by Jack Finney. Have you ever read it? No, I've never read that book. Um. I think that was his major book. He was very well known when he was writing. I d it's not a classic, but it's just a great read. You, mm -hmm. you should read it. <laughs> I'm just, okay. I just have it every day. It's very I'll write interesting. It down. I don't know. I read so much that, and I read a lot. So, um, and a lot of contemporary books that I think mm -hmm. are very good. Um, Elizabeth Stroud. I mean, I can go on and on. You know, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I always find it kind of uh, telling what what a writer is reading while they're writing, but I guess that when you read so much all the time, it's kind of hard to say, so I can totally relate to that because I'm constantly reading stuff. It's hard for me to tell you what book I was reading last week. Exactly. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I, and I also read, like, I'll read five books at the same time until I get really engrossed in a book, and then I'll stop the others and keep going. I can't do that. I have to read one at a time because I like to, maybe it's just me, but when I'm reading a book, I find myself constantly scribbling in it because I'm just really into it, especially if it's good. And if I'm not hooked by the first couple of chapters, then I like to throw it against a wall. And That's true. That can be my <laughs> that is true. dramatic conclusion because I'm not getting it by finishing it. So that's kind of something that I like to do. But anyway, um, my last question that I wanted to ask you before we wrap up the interview, which has been fantastic, is um, what's next for you? What are you working on right now? Like, are you, I think you mentioned earlier that you're working on a new book. Is there anything about that that you can share with us? Yeah, um, it's a multi-generational historical book that I've been working on forever, it seems. Um, it was, it's based on interviews I did of very elder, the, the very elderly um, that I was using as re research. And I which is fascinating to me. They spoke a different way, they thought a different way, and it's a different generation, completely different generation. That um, anyway, I fictionalized it. It's it's the story of the twentieth century and and a family within that century and families, I should say, around it. So sounds kind of similar. <laughs> I'm sorry. So it sounds similar, but I bet it's really, really different. Just because I feel as though whatever you're going to end up writing, if it has something to do with family, I hope that it has some of the same undercurrents as Paragon Island because I really, really loved it. Oh, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then you know what? That wraps up our interview. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, Diane. I really okay. enjoyed it. Please come back again when your next novel is published. We'd love to read it. Okay. Um, Great. And thank, thank you, everyone, for joining us. This has been a Merrill Moss Media and Book Trade Production. And see you next time, everybody. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>